So welcome to a plastic surgery preview for surgical technologists. I'm Mark Sowers, and today we're going to take a quick look at many of the procedures that are done during plastic surgery. And we'll start by reviewing some of the terms and anatomy that are associated with plastic surgery. So the first term will be the medical term chylo, as in chyloplasty. Now, the way I remember this is because chylo means lips. And the way you pronounce it is Kylo, as in Kylo Ren, the character from Star Wars. And of course, you have Adam Driver being the actor who plays Kylo Ren. And I mean, look at those lips. Come on. Plastic surgery usually involves the skin in some sort. So we'll take a look at a few of the major structures of the skin. In the skin, we have a couple of glands. We have, of course, around the hair root itself, we have a sebaceous gland. This is a gland that produces sebum. It's an oily substance that keeps the hair follicle moisturized. We also have two types of sweat glands. Now, sweat is the watery substance that's put out across the skin to help keep us cool. Now, the two types are apocrine sweat gland, in which case the sweat comes out by the hair follicle. And we have eccrine glands, in which case the sweat simply comes out through a natural hole in the skin. So apocrine and eccrine are the two types of sweat glands. Now in our ear canal, we have apocrine glands, which are known as ceruminous glands. And these work with sebaceous glands to produce a mixture that forms earwax. Another name for earwax is cerumen. So ceruminous glands help produce earwax or cerumen. Skin's broken up into several layers. We have the epidermis, which is the outer layer of the skin. And underneath that, we have the dermis, which is a very alive, very living tissue with lots of blood vessels flowing through this area. The upper layer, the epidermis, can be made up with as many as five different smaller sublayers. And these layers are known as the stratum corneum, the outermost layer, mostly dead skin cells, the stratum lucidum, the stratum granulosum, the stratum spinosum, and the stratum basale. So basale looks like base, and that's where it comes from, the base or the bottom layer of the epidermis. The dermis is where not only the blood vessels, but also all the sweat glands and the sebaceous glands live. That's also where the hair follicles exist. That's where the hair grows from. So there's lots of nutrients in this area. Now, just below the dermis, we have a fatty layer, sometimes known as the hypodermis, so usually known as the subcutaneous or sub-Q is how you're going to hear it often in the surgical sites. Now, when the skin is exposed to heat, it can get burned. And depending on which layers are involved in that burn determines which category or class of burn you're dealing with. So a first degree burn involves the epidermis only the skin turns a reddish or pinkish color. Second degree burns start to extend down into the dermis where the dermis itself starts to feel those effects. Here we can have bubbling, blistering, or even peeling away of the epidermis exposing the dermis. Third degree burns tend to get deeper still. In this case, we're going down through the dermis, possibly even into the subcutaneous, that fatty layer, Burns like these often have a pearly white color. So if you're a carnivore, think of steak, how when you cook a steak, that fatty layer still stays nice and white or a yellowish white. That's similar to the color that you might see in a third degree burn. Now, fourth degree burns, in this case, we're getting down past the fatty layer and into the muscle underneath itself. So it's the muscle itself that's burning in a fourth degree burn. And this can become very charred. It gets a very black look. So a third degree burn versus a fourth degree burn, we're talking about a pearly white coloring versus a very charred black coloring. To determine the extent of burns that our patient may have, we go by something called the rule of nines. Now, in this case, we're talking about the percent of the body that's been burned. So we've divided the body into sections of nines or four and a half, which is half of nine, or 18, which is double nine. So when sections of the body are burned, let's say the entire front section of the arm, that would be four and a half, the back section of the arm, that would be another four and a half. So the entire arm, if that were burned, that would be considered as 9% of the body. The entire torso and abdomen, 18%. The entire back of the body, 18%. Each leg, front and back, would each be 9%. The face and the head, the front, 4.5%. The back, 4.5%. So a total of 9 And again, this is a quick way of estimating the extent of the burns that the patients received. 
Now, when it comes to infants or children, the rule of nine breaks down a little bit because the percentages are a little bit different. So generally, the rule of nine is used on adult patients. To repair skin that has been burned away or otherwise removed for some reason, we can do a skin graft, in which case we're going to take skin from one part of the body and move it to a different part of the body and reattach it there. And there are a couple of different ways to do this. There is a split thickness skin graft and there's a full thickness skin graft. I'm going to go over the two of these. Split thickness, we're taking the epidermis and just part of the dermis. We're going to leave much of the dermis in place so that where we took it from, the donor area, can then regrow that skin pretty easily. So a split thickness skin graft is going to take a little bit of the skin away, that top layer, the epidermis, and just a little bit of the dermis, and then leaving the rest of the dermis in place so it can regrow. A full thickness skin graft is when we're going to take the entire epidermis and the entire dermis all the way down to the hypodermis or that fatty layer. Now in a case like this, we're usually going to suture the skin back together, so we're not going to leave a hole there. We're just going to bring the existing skin back together and cover up that hole where we took the graft from. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to each of these types of skin grafts, so it depends on what we're trying to accomplish as to which one we're going to use. The advantages to a full thickness skin graft is the looks, is how it appears. In this case, we're taking the entire skin, laying it over the new location, suturing it into place, and now, now you're going to have this nice smooth layer of skin replacing where there wasn't any before. The disadvantage is this is living skin. This is alive and growing actively, and it needs a good blood supply. And it's hard to get a good blood supply into an actively growing, actively living transplant such as this. So we're going to suture it into place, but often what will happen is the skin graft is not going to quite take, and some of that may die because it didn't quite get the blood that it needed in order to survive. So while the end result may end up looking better, it's rather challenging to get to that point. With split thickness skin grafts, we take a slightly different approach, and in this case, Appearance isn't so much what we're going after. We're just simply trying to cover the wound and bring some layer of protection back where there wasn't any before. So split thickness skin grafts are often taken from maybe the leg or the buttocks area. And they're taken using a device known as a dermatome. And in this case, we have a blade and different size blades that we're going to install in the dermatome. And they're going to, it's going to vibrate, it's going to cut through the skin, taking that very top layer, the epidermis, and just a little bit of the dermis layer off so that where we're grafting it from, that skin will be able to regrow in that area. Now to do this, because this is again a very fine layer of tissue that we're taking, we're usually going to use something like mineral oil to put on the skin, and that's going to make the blade slide nice and easy. It's not going to get jammed up in there as it scoots along the skin. You use forceps to pull the skin away and hold it nice and tight as the dermatone goes through the skin. And then we're going to place the skin graft, this split thickness skin graft, into something called a mesher or a mesh graft device. And this is kind of cool. Here's what happens. We can take a smaller piece of skin graft and actually make it so that it stretches to cover a larger area. Especially if the patient has large burns, we want to use that skin as efficiently as we possibly can, which means make it cover as big of an area as possible. And the mesher allows us to do this, and here's what it does. So if we take our skin graft, and I have it sort of represented here by a piece of paper, it's going to cover a certain size. But if we mesh it, we can then stretch this skin out to a larger and larger area, and yeah, there are going to be holes in it, but it's going to cover a larger area. This is what the mesher does to the skin graft. And you can see that here as it comes out of the mesher, it has all these little holes in it that allows it, the skin to be stretched over a larger area. So what's the advantage to doing a split layer skin graft like this and meshing it and stretching it out? Well, the idea, here's how I think of it. Instead of taking a thick living piece of skin and trying to place it in a new location, trying to get it to grow and take there, instead what we're doing with this split layer skin graft is we're planting little skin seeds all along the wound. These little seeds, these little skin cells are going to be stretched out across this wound. 
Because they're smaller, because it's more like a seed, it needs less blood supply initially as it begins to grow, and it'll grow into those blood supplies. Those blood supplies will grow into that new skin a little bit later, a little slower, and it has a better chance of taking. So here you can see where we've done a split thickness skin graft. We've meshed the skin and then stretched it out over that wound. Now what will happen in this case is we're going to cover it up with gauze and press that skin, those seeds, onto the tissue below, allow those blood vessels to grow in and activate those skin seeds, if you will, and allow it to grow. Now when those seeds eventually do grow and heal, they're going to cover this entire wound area, offering that protection that was removed when the skin was removed. The disadvantage, as you can sort of see here, is that it doesn't always look as nice as a full thickness skin graft would. And here you can see the meshing, those little lines are still remain, that scar tissue that still remains in the skin, but at least the wound is covered. And for extensive wounds, this is an efficient way of using skin grafts. A Z-plasty is a type of scar revision. Now in this case, what happens is scar tissue, scar tissue is different from skin tissue. Skin tissue is very flexible. It tends to stretch a whole lot. Scar tissue is just an emergency stopgap to sort of cover that skin over and heal it. But it's very fibrous. It's very thick material. It's almost, it's almost like fascia. Okay. It's a real tough material. Scar tissue is. So when you have a scar, let's say on the inside of your finger, again, the skin that's normally there on the inside of the finger, as you stretch and expand and open and close your finger, the skin stretches and expands with it. But scar tissue, if you have a scar that runs down the length of the finger, that scar tissue is tough. It's not going to flex. It's not going to stretch as much as regular skin will. So what we can do is we can actually go in and remove that scar tissue and give that flexibility back to that finger. And this is what it looks like. We're going to use a Z plasty because we're going to make an incision that looks like a Z. So we're going to incise around the scar tissue itself, remove the scar tissue, and then we're going to make these two little lines that come off of it, making the top and the bottom of the Z. Now what this is going to do is going to create two skin flaps. And we're going to take those skin flaps and we're going to reverse them this way. And here's the advantage. Initially, the incision ran up and down the fit length of the finger. And if you let this new wound heal, you're going to get a new scar that runs up and down the length of the finger. But if we flip those little pieces of skin, we change the direction of the scar. So instead of running up and down the finger, the scar is now going to run back and forth across the finger. And that's actually a good thing when it comes to flexibility because you don't have a long piece of tough tissue running up and down the finger. You only have little pieces that run across and the rest of the skin can expand and contract as you bend the finger. So a Z-plasty is making a Z-like incision in the skin, removing the scar tissue, and then flipping the direction that the scar is going to reheal, allowing for elasticity in the direction that you need. And you'll see this a lot in many different types of joints, not just the finger. Here we're showing in the axillary or the underarm area where we had a vertical scar that was preventing or causing difficulty for this patient to lift their arm. So we can Z-plasty that out, that scar, and we can change the direction of that scar so that it's not pulling in the direction that the arm wants to move. And there's lots of different variations on this technique depending on the goals that we're trying to achieve. A normal Z-plasty changes the direction of the scar. But then you can also do something like a Y-plasty, which is actually going to stretch or extend the skin a little bit. In this case, we've made a V incision. We've pulled the front tab up, sutured the bottom piece closed, and then sutured that V back together at the top, making this sort of a Y shape. And the advantage to that is that we've stretched the skin in this direction a little bit. We've given a little bit more skin in this direction. And you can actually have really complicated geometries involved in something like this. You can see one here where we've taken a piece of skin, cut it up into several different flaps, and then rearranged those flaps in some such a way that what was sort of a round piece of skin, we've stretched it out so that it is much narrower and much longer and probably fits the patient in a better way. So here's a really cool example of just how this works. Here you can see the patient has a wound on his nose and what the doctor has done is already drawn in the incision lines that they're going to make. We're going to take flap one from just above the wound and move it into the wound itself. 
And then we've just created a new wound. So we're going to take flap two, which is a little bit smaller, move it into where flap one was to fill up that wound. And then where two, wound two was, we're just going to pinch that and close that and suture it together. So we've taken those skin flaps, rotated them into the wound, and making each of the remaining wounds a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. And the results of this are really impressive. In this case, it looks a whole lot better than it did before. Now, plastic surgery is often about looking better. It's about the appearance of the patient. And in this case, we have something called dermatillasis. Now, dermatillasis is a drooping of the skin. The skin becomes less elastic. It just sort of droops a little bit. And here you can see that the eyelids of the patient are starting to droop down and sort of cover the eye a little bit. So we're going to do something called a blepharoplasty. Now, plasty means a remodeling or a reshaping, and blepharo refers to the eyelids. So a blepharoplasty is a reshaping of the eyelids. So in this case, we're going to remove that extra tissue by making a crescent-shaped incision and then bringing that together, reducing the amount of tissue there and opening the eye up for the patient. And this is the result. You can see that there's a lot less tissue in that upper eyelid. The eyes are now wider, more open, and brighter, giving a different appearance. But this type of surgery isn't reserved for just older patients with dermatillasis, that drooping of the skin. Sometimes younger people will want a blepharoplasty as well. Often people of Asian descent will want a little tissue in the upper eyelid removed to make their eyes look a little bit more open. Similar to a blepharoplasty, in which case we're working on the eyelid, in this case we're working on the eyebrow, which is the tissue just above the eyelid, and we're going to do an endoscopic brow lift. We're going to lift the eyebrow and the tissue around it to give a more pleasing appearance to that. Here we're going to make incisions all the way up here at the hairline, go under the skin of the forehead down to the eyebrow itself, pull that skin up a little bit and attach it into place there, and then remove those instruments so that the scar line is way up here where it can't be seen. The eyebrow is lifted. It has a little bit more curve to it. It opens the eyes a little bit more. Some patients want to enhance their cheekbones. So the medical term for cheekbone is malar. So we can do malar implants where we're going to take a little piece of prosthesis and put it just into or under the cheekbone and sort of build that tissue up, creating a different appearance on the face. Similar to this, but with the chin, we could do something called a mentoplasty. Again, mento meaning the chin, mental, mento meaning the chin. In this case, some patients may have something called micronatia, which means a smaller or pulled back chin. And the patient may want to extend that out, making the shape of their face a little bit different. And you can see the results here. Now, in this case, I think it's a bad picture because the skin coloring is different. He's got a little stubble going on, but yeah, the chin itself is brought out. Now, some guys looking for the same effect, but don't want to go to the surgery option, they'll just grow a beard, which will fill out this part of their face. And autoplasty means the revision or restructuring of the ears. Auto meaning ear. Plasty meaning a restructuring. And in this case, often children will come out with, say, ears that extend out a little bit more than they would like. So we're able to go in and change the shape of those ears and bring them back together. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to make a crescent incision in the skin behind the ear. And we're actually going to go in and make a crescent incision into the cartilage of the ear itself. And then we're going to bring that cartilage together, suturing it together, bring the skin together, suturing it together. And the result is that the ear itself, the auricle of the ear, will be pulled back closer to the head. A rhinoplasty is a reshaping of the nose. In this case, you can see that the patient has a nose that sort of has an outer curve to it. And after the rhinoplasty, what we've done is gone in, removed a little bit of the cartilage in the nose in the center, and then brought it together, reducing the ridge of that nose and giving it more of an inner curve. And here you can see where those two pieces of the upper cartilage come together at the septum. Again, we're going to cut out a section of that cartilage, bring them back together at a lower point, and that's going to change the shape of the nose. A rhytidectomy. This is a big fancy term for a facelift. In this case, we have the skin that's sort of drooped down. It's lost its elasticity a little bit. We're going to take the entire skin of the face and lift it up into a higher position, cutting away some of that extra skin, and it reduces those wrinkles and changes the shape of the skin of the face. A rhytidectomy is the medical term for a facelift. 
Now, facelifts or right hydectomies can be a little challenging because we want to protect all the nerves running through this area. We have the facial nerve, cranial nerve number seven, and the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve number five running through this area. And as we lift the face, as we cut through that skin and move it around, reposition it, we want to take care not to damage either of these nerves. Often on children, we'll do a procedure called a chyloplasty and maybe a cleft palate repair. Now, chyloplasty, again, we're talking about the lips. So we're going to repair the lips and the cleft palate. Now, the palate is that piece of bone and tissue that extends back across the roof of the mouth. And sometimes during development, pieces of those don't come together and they form a break or a cleft in the palate. And sometimes that extends into the front lip as well. So we can do, go in and do a chyloplasty, repairing the lip, and a cleft palate repair to improve the appearance and functioning of the mouth. Hand and foot anatomy. Now, in one of the books used for surgical technology, hand and foot surgery is concluded in the plastic surgery chapter, and that's why I'm including it here. So let's go over a little bit of hand and foot anatomy. The hand is made up of many small bones. We have the phalanges, which are in the fingers, and the phalanges are named by their position. So we have the distal or distant phalange, medial or middle phalange, and then we have the proximal or closer phalange, the phalange that's closer to the body. Within the palm of the hand, we have metacarpal bones, and then we have carpal bones around the wrist. Leading away from the wrist down the arm, we have the radius, which is the larger bone, and the ulna, which is the smaller one. Now, how do I remember which one's which? Well, a student actually gave me this tip. So she said that radius sort of sounds like rad, as in, that's really rad, man. And that happens to be with the thumb side. So the rad or radius side of the arm is the thumb side of the arm. So while in the hand we have carpals and metacarpals, in the foot we have tarsals and metatarsals. And often there's a problem with the joint between the metatarsal and the phalanges of the foot, this joint being the MTP, metatarsal phalangeal joint, or MPJ, metatarsal phalangeal joint. A couple of different ways of noting it there. And in this case, we're going to go in and repair that joint. One way to do this is by putting a plate across it, by fusing that joint together so it doesn't flex anymore and creating essentially one large bone. This is called, when we take two bones and put them together, we fuse them together, this is known as an arthrodesis. So arthrodesis is fusing a joint so it doesn't bend anymore. So some of the surgeries involving hands and feet, we can have a case where a finger or phalange has been cut off and we want to replant that finger into place. Now the approach that we're going to use to do this is that we're going to start in the center of the finger and work our way out. So in the center of the finger, the first thing we have is the bone. So we're going to bring the bone together. We're going to reduce that fracture, that break, and bring it back together and probably use suture or plates to hold that bone in place. Then we're going to work on the tendons right around that bone. We're going to bring the tendons together, suture them together, and you can see a couple of different suturing methods here that can be used to bring tendons together so they hold tight. Outside of the tendons, we're then going to work on the nerves and the blood vessels. So the nerves and the blood vessels would be the next step or the third step in the replantation procedure. And then finally, suturing the skin, and that's going to be the outermost layer. Now, there are often reasons why a finger can't be replanted. Now, if the patient's lost one of the fingers, usually there's three other fingers that remain, so the functionality of the hand is still in place. But if it's the thumb, well, that's a different story. The thumb is important for grasping. And if that can't be replanted, we're going to transfer one of the toes into that position so that the patient has something that they can use to grasp with. And here you can see the result of a toe-to-hand transfer where a toe has been used in place of a thumb. Sometimes a patient will come in with a condition known as Dupretrin's contracture. Now in this case, we have fascia, again, that very tough fibrous layer immediately under the skin. This skin fascia can sometimes start to sort of bundle up against itself, sort of start to ball up and create this little nodule that prevents the fingers from extending the whole way because, again, that very tough fibrous tissue is pulling the finger back down and it can extend the whole way. 
So when this happens, we can go in and remove that fascia. We're going to do a fasciectomy. We're going to ectomy. We're going to remove the fascia that's causing this little contracture, this little nodule of fascia. We're going to take that out. And by removing that, the patient will then be able to extend their fingers fully. So here you can see the surgeon's going in through the skin, removing that fascia. You can see that knotted up piece of fascia there. But remember with the Z-plasty, we had to be careful how we close an incision like this because if we just make a vertical line, we're going to get a vertical scar. And that scar tissue, again, that tough fibrous tissue, is going to again prevent the finger from opening fully. So the incision that we're going to use is going to be sort of in a zigzag shape. And again, just like the Z-plasty, this zigzag shape is going to then allow the skin to heal. The scars deform in this cross finger direction rather than up and down or along the finger. And that way the skin is flexible and it's able to extend all the way open. Radial dysplasia. This is a condition that infants will often have. This is a congenital condition where the radius, the rad bone, didn't form. It maybe grew a little too short or maybe didn't grow at all. And because that bone didn't form or was a little too short, the hand is tilted towards the thumb direction. And you can see here how different lengths of the radius can affect the final position of the hand. So we can do a procedure called centralization of radial dysplasia. And in this case, we only have, in some cases, only the one bone, the ulna. So instead of having the ulna end up on the pinky side of the hand, on this side, we're going to shift it so that it ends up over here. And what's that going to do? It's going to push the hand back into a more natural direction. Syndactyly and polydactyly are conditions where fingers have either grown together that's syndactyl, or polydactyl, where more than the usual number of fingers or toes have grown. So syndactyl is the fingers or toes are brought together, and polydactyl means we have more than the usual number. So in this case, we can do surgery to separate syndactyl digits or remove extra digits. Carpal tunnel release. Now, carpal tunnel syndrome is a common condition that many people will have, especially if they do a lot of typing. They put pressure on the palm of the hand right here at the wrist area. Now running between the two carpal bones on either side of the wrist, we have a ligament known as the carpal ligament that runs across here. And we have several tendons from the arm muscles that run underneath this ligament, and that's what moves the fingers back and forth. But then also in that same gap, in the same tunnel underneath this ligament, we have the median nerve, which is a nerve that brings sensory information to several of the fingers. And as you continually apply pressure to this part of the hand, say through typing or something, it can cause this tunnel to collapse in on this nerve and cause it to pinch and therefore not function. And you lose sensation or maybe you have a tingling sensation in your fingers. So because this ligament that goes through here, this carpal ligament, isn't really necessary for the functioning of the hand, what we can do is simply go in and cut it in half. That's going to release the ligament. It's going to open up that tunnel and allow that nerve to expand and work naturally. So often in order to hold the fingers open during a procedure like this, the surgeon is going to use something called a lead hand. And this is often a malleable piece of metal that bends around the fingers and helps support and hold those fingers open while the surgery is going on. So this is known as a lead hand. During the open version of this procedure, the surgeon is going to make an incision through the wrist, find that ligament, that carpal ligament, and simply cut it, but being very careful not to cut any of the tendons or the median nerve underneath. You can see here that that incision will often have that Z shape to it because this wrist, you don't want to put tension on the wrist as that scar heals. But a more common approach to use nowadays is a minimally invasive technique. In this case, we're not making a huge incision. We're just going to make a small incision, and then we're going to insert a carpal tunnel knife, which is a special kind of knife used specifically to cut the carpal ligament. Now, to do this, we're going to take a little probe. It has a little groove in it. We're going to insert it under the carpal ligament, make sure that it's lined up and all the other tissue that we don't want to cut is away. We'll take our knife, put it in the groove, and simply slide the knife along the groove, the sharp part being out front. It's going to catch that carpal ligament and slice cleanly through it, releasing that carpal tunnel. 
So a common type of plastic surgery is going to be breast surgeries, and we'll take a look at a few of these here. Augmentation mammoplasty, in this case mammoplasty, meaning a reshaping of the breast. Augmentation, meaning we're adding to or filling it up. So in this case, we're going to be making the breast larger. And there's several different incisions that the doctor could choose to use depending on the exact goals that the patient has. You can see that those incisions are named by the shape of those incisions, anything from the crescent to the periareolar around the areola. Lollipop kind of looks like a lollipop. An anchor incision kind of looks like an anchor or a combination of the anchor with the areola reduction. Now, breast augmentation usually involves some sort of implant. Used to be silicone implants. Nowadays, it's more of a saline-filled bag that's placed behind the breast tissue to give a fuller appearance of the breast. And there's two different places the surgeon could choose to place this implant. One would be above the chest wall muscle. The pectoralis major is the large muscle of the chest. So the implant could go above the chest wall muscle. But more commonly nowadays, as surgeons are placing it behind the pectoralis major muscle. And what this will do is it will give a more smooth, more natural appearance to the breast. Sometimes if a patient has had a mastectomy, the removal of a breast, we can bring back some of the shape of that area by doing something called a tram flap or a transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap. We say tram flap because it's a whole lot easier. Now let's discuss flaps first, and there's two different types. One is a free flap. That's kind of like with the skin grafts we were doing. We're just taking a piece of skin and moving it to a different section. This would be a free flap because when we remove it from one section and put it to the other, there's nothing connecting it. It's free from its connections. But we could also have what's called a pedicled flap. Now, a pedicle means we leave the connection to the tissue. So we're going to leave the blood vessels, we're going to leave the nerves in place, but we're still going to move that piece of skin to a different location. So in a tram flap, we're often doing a pedicle flap where we're removing the skin and even some muscle from one area and moving it up into the location of the breast. And here you can see how we're going to do this procedure. We're going to make an incision in the chest area where the flap's going to go. And then we're going to make another sort of crescent incision down in the stomach area. This is where we're going to get the tissue from. We're going to get the skin and even possibly some muscle, some of that rectus abdominis muscle. And we're going to leave it connected to its blood supply and its nerve supply. Bring it under the skin of the abdomen in the thorax. And then bring it out in that new opening that we've created in the chest. This is going to fill up or enhance that area. Then we're going to suture together that crescent incision in the stomach and the patient will actually end up getting a little bit of a tummy tuck in that same area at the same time. Because we've used a pedicled flap, the blood vessels and the nerves are intact, some of the sensation in this new breast area will remain. And here you can see again the results of this. We've taken some of the abdominal skin and the abdominal muscle, the rectus abdominis, moved it up into the chest area, sutured it into place, and it fills out that chest area, giving a little bit more of a natural shape to the chest. But although we brought a more general breast shape to the chest area, some of the details are still missing, and some patients want to bring those details back as well. And in this case, it's the nipple and the areola which is missing. So after the first surgery heals, we can go back into a second surgery called a nipple reconstruction. And in this case, we made a special zigzag type of incision and are able to bend the skin around and create a little raised area that sort of looks like a nipple. And then after that heals, we can bring in a tattoo artist to create the areola. So often the areola will be created with a real tattoo to look like a natural areola. And some of these tattoo artists are really good. In fact, the nipple reconstruction doesn't necessarily have to be done. The tattoo artist can draw in the shading and the shape of a nipple itself, giving the appearance that there's a nipple there, but in actuality, the skin is actually smooth. A mastopexy involves reshaping the breast. In this case, the breast maybe has sagged a little bit, and we want to bring it up and fix it in place. That's what pexy means, to fix or solidify into place. So a mastopexy is we're bringing that breast up and fixing it in a higher position than it was before. 
And you can see some of the incisions that we're doing here. We're going to cut some of the tissue away from the bottom side of the breast, bring that breast tissue together, making the bottom side of the breast smaller. But when we do that, the nipple itself is going to look a little out of place. So we're going to incise or cut around the nipple and bring that higher into the breast chest wall itself, into the breast tissue, putting it in a more natural position when we finally close everything up. And the result is a more uplifted looking breast. And there are a couple of surgeries that can help reshape the abdominal area. One of those surgeries is known as liposuction, or the fancy medical term is suction lipectomy. Again, ectomy means removal, lipo means fat or fatty tissue, so a suction lipectomy is removing fat. Now to do this procedure, the doctor will often fill up that fatty tissue with a tumescent solution. Now this tumescent solution is mostly saline, but it also contains some lidocaine for pain control and epinephrine to keep that lidocaine in place. So it's going to expand and fill up and make very stiff and tough this fatty layer. Then once it's nice and solid feeling, the surgeon will be able to go in with the suction and suction out these areas, suction out some of that fatty tissue. Now, after the surgery, there's going to be several holes and tunnels in that fatty tissue that are eventually reduced down naturally. And after several weeks, you'll get the desired shape. An abdominoplasty is a little bit more involved than just liposuction. In this case, we're going to be taking away not just some of the fatty tissue, but some of the skin itself. Say the skin is extended out and we want to reduce the amount of skin in the abdominal area. So in this case, we're going to make, again, a crescent kind of incision, probably around the umbilicus, around the belly button. And we're going to pull the two layers of skin together and suture them together down below the bikini line. Now, when we do this, that's going to move the umbilicus or the belly button out of position. So just like we did with the nipple previously, we're going to then move that up higher in the abdominal skin wall, and we're going to suture it back into place in a more natural position. So an abdominoplasty or a tummy tuck is a reshaping of the abdominal skin area. So that's a quick preview of many of the plastic surgery procedures you may see. But understand that with plastic surgery, there's all kinds of new developments happening all the time. So the procedures that you see in the clinical sites may look quite a bit different from the ones described here.